Among the top five species of sharks when discussing the cartilaginous cretins are the hammerhead sharks. Our grade school books on the subject made it seem, at least to me, that there was only one type of hammerhead shark and that it was just a weird version of the other sharks. As nature is far from that clear cut, there are many more species of hammerheads which take certain body parts to greater or lesser extremes. There are of course the ones we're familiar with, the great hammerhead shark and the scalloped hammerhead shark. These sharks have the famously elongated skulls which branch out to the sides, widening the space between the eyes to a ridiculous extreme, rarely seen in vertebrate animals. If we think about the hammerheads in an evolutionary perspective, there should be, now or in the past, species with shorter, more stereotypically shark-like heads, and some with even longer hammers. And of course, there are. The hammerhead sharks, belonging to the scientific group Spherinidae, are quite a few steps away from other famous sharks, like the Great White, Mako, or Thresher. They are part of the bigger grouping called ground sharks, or Carcharhiniformes. The hammerhead sharks as a whole originate in the Paleocene epoch. Among the giant gastornids, Titanoboa, and survivors of the KT mass extinction, lived the humble ancestors to the hammerheads. If the modern trends in shapes and sizes of the hammerheads is anything to go by, some of the earliest forms of the hammerheads may have had extremely large skulls. Meet the winghead shark. Like many sharks of the world, the winghead shark was first officially described a long time ago. In 1785, German medical doctor and naturalist Marcus Bloch was the first to recognize the shark now known as the winghead. Bloch was an interesting character, as he was one of the few scientists who didn't come from wealth or privilege. Though I can't account for his moral character, for the 1700s he's got my respect for clawing his way to academia. He's also considered one of the most important ichthyologists of the 18th century, and did a lot of good science we don't normally associate with the time frame. He described every bit of anatomy of the winghead shark and thought its bizarre anatomy was too similar to the smoothhead hammerhead shark to be its own distinct species, and was thus called a squalus zygina, which eventually becomes Sferna zygina after a time. The identification of the winghead shark was then deflected from Marcus Bloch to another, perhaps more famous naturalist, Georges Cuvier, a French naturalist who came from wealth and was borderline on the genius level. Cuvier was also a preeminent zoologist and is known as the father of paleontology. He made a note of the new shark specimen Marcus Bloch had described in one of his textbooks, but left out a name. Cuvier did notice it was not a species already known to science, but the naming of this wacky, boomerang-headed shark would go to Cuvier's colleague, Achille Valenciennes. Valenciennes simply considered the shark a subspecies of the other known hammerheads, and named it Zygonae Blockii Nobis. Almost 100 years later, our old pal Theodore Gills, a well-known figure in the history of ichthyology, came back to this creature to better describe and differentiate it from its peers. He gave it a new genus name, Eusphyra, which translates to good hammer. The parts of the skull which make up the hammer are called the cephalofoil. This is because it's part of the head, the cephalus, and may act as a hydrofoil for the shark to ride currents and cut through the water with ease. If we take a look at all of the living hammerhead sharks, from the bonnet head with one of the shortest cephalofoils, to our current best friend, the winghead, with the longest cephalofoil, which would you think is the most primitive in the characteristics it has kept through the millions of years? I don't know about you, but I would think the one with the smallest cephalofoil would have split off the hammerhead tree the earliest with more and more recent splits having bigger cephalofoils. The reason I would think this, and perhaps you too, is because in general, organisms start out small, with less specialized bits and bobs. The ancestors of the giraffes didn't have long necks. The ancestors of the dinosaurs were small and rabbit-like, and the ancestors of the whales were almost weasels. Over time, Things trend towards bigger sizes as they jostle for more resources and find open ecological niches to specialize in. When it comes to the hammerhead sharks, this is reversed. The most primitive form of modern hammerheads is the winghead shark, followed by your average hammerhead like the great hammerhead or smooth hammerhead. 
with the bonnet head the most recent evolutionary change. Of course, all of them have continued to change to pressures in their environment, and none of them are literally primitive. Those I call primitive have split off from the hammerhead tree earlier than others, and have retained features which may have been present in the most recent common ancestor, before the split. The winghead shark is far from just a stretched out version of a hammerhead. The cephalofoil is about half the length of the shark's body, which is kind of crazy to me. The nostril openings are stretched out and are twice as long as the width of the mouth. The eyes are placed on the ends of the cephalofoil. The cephalofoil itself can't be called eye stalks, since it's not made of eye bones, but the entire skull. What is interesting about the winghead shark's vision is that since the eyes are positioned near the front of the cephalofoil's ends and are oriented forward, the shark has incredible binocular vision. Their overlapping fields of view are beyond that of all other hammerheads, and even more proficient than many other species of sharks with which it was compared. Exactly the purpose of the cephalofoil has been argued for centuries. Extending the eyes away from the center of the head and directing them forward may have evolved to increase the depth perception in early forms, as exemplified by the winghead shark. However, one of the most widely agreed upon purposes is sensory. Certain parts of the skulls of these sharks suggest enhanced ability to sense chemical, electrical, and physical changes in the environment, to better maneuver the animal, and to better find food and mates. Like many other sharks, hammerheads have pores scattered around their face, which sense the electrical signals of other animals. These pores lead to tubes, which connect to the brain for signal exchange. These pores are spread out over the hammerhead's cephalofoil, giving these sharks an increased electro-sense. Since the nostrils are the most stretched out of all the hammerheads, they contain more sensory hairs, which pick up chemicals floating in the water more effectively. The stretched noggin also pulls the nostrils farther apart than in other hammerheads, letting the shark know from which direction smells are coming from even better. Apparently, there's also a lateral line across the face. Most fish have what is called a lateral line organ across their sides, which is a sensory organ providing details of change in water pressure and vibrations from movement. Since there is a larger surface area on the winghead shark's head, it can sense pressure and vibration much better. What does it use these enhanced abilities to eat? Winghead sharks are mainly predators of small fish and crustaceans. They'll also take cephalopods, and probably other small animals that can't get away. Unlike the frilled shark we previously took a look at, the winghead shark has a placenta-like organ attaching the embryos to the mother. These sharks give live birth to 6 to 25 pups after a gestation period of 8 to 11 months. For some reason, I thought these sharks were small when I first saw a picture of them. That might be due to the enormous noggin, making things look out of proportion but they can actually grow to 6 feet, 1.9 meters. They're found in tropical, shallow waters close to shore, from the Persian Gulf, South and Southeast Asia, Taiwan, New Guinea, to Northern Queensland and Western Australia. These sharks are deemed harmless to humans as they mainly prey on small critters like fish and crabs, and don't really have a mouth big enough to deal life-threatening damage to a human. On top of that, they don't go after humans, the quite intelligent, long-lived winghead shark is now registered as an endangered animal. Due to human overfishing, it's often caught as bycatch with other fish and are turned into fish meal as a result. The winghead shark is also caught on purpose throughout Asian coasts for their flesh, their fins for use in shark fin soup, and their liver for use as vitamin oil. I personally don't get the shark fin soup thing because I'm a dumb dirty American. Big predators like sharks and whales are incredibly intelligent and live lives we can easily empathize with, so people butchering them as though they were any other fish, which is also wrong for many more reasons, is rather inhumane. Just make some chicken noodle, chili, or egg foo young or something. Shark fin soup can't literally be good enough to genocide entire species. Come on, nah. Since this is the first shark week I've participated in, this may be the last episode for this year. So, if it is, Glad we got to spend this time together. It's been real. Hopefully you learned something, as I did in researching these videos. There's a whole world of sharks out there to know about, 
and I can't wait for next year. Subscribe to consume some delicious contento. Gore the like button, scratch out a comment, and jostle the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. A very special thanks to my patrons Andy Volano, Rob Biondolilo, Ed Pretz, Pretzi Pizzara, Thea Svensson, Dinosaur, Natty Cat, and Dana Manchester. If you'd like to support my channel and receive some extra content, pledge to my patron at any tier you want.